negative radical 3 plus i raised to the sixth power. Okay. Um, and, and I want to do a task here that um, just kind of opens your eyes maybe to the benefit of having De Moyer's theorem. Okay, so I want to take uh, this thing and, and instead of going to the sixth power, let's go to the seventh power. Let's go to the seventh power because I think that's going to be a little bit um, more insightful. Uh, I want to take this thing and I want to start foiling it. Okay, so I'm going to write this thing out. I don't be intelligent about how we do it, but negative radical 3 plus 1, or sorry, plus 1i uh, times, you know, negative radical 3 plus i. And I'm going to do that seven times, right? Okay, well, let, let, me, let me ask you this. If I do this, okay, that's negative radical 3 plus i squared, right? If I cube my result, and then multiply that by negative radical 3 plus i. Is that still negative radical 3 plus i to the seventh? Does that make sense? Is this is squared. Squared to the third is the sixth. And if you multiply something to the sixth times the same base to the first, it would be the seventh, right? Um, that might be beneficial, and it might even be more beneficial uh, to maybe break it up into powers of two. So what if I, um, well, let's just leave it that way. Let, let, let's see what this looks like first. Um, it, it just is going to allow me to not have to write this thing out seven times. Um, but if I FOIL this, negative radical three times negative radical three is three, right? Okay. Negative radical three times I, negative radical three I, okay, uh, negative radical 3 times I is another negative radical 3 times I, and then I times I gives me I squared, which is negative 1, okay, so now I've got 3 minus 1, so that's 2, minus 2 radical 3 times I, right? And that's going to be raised to the third power. And I got negative radical 3 plus i as well. Okay. Can I then take this 2 minus 2 radical 3i, 2 minus 2 radical 3i, 2 minus 2 radical 3i times negative radical 3 plus i? Is that really what I've got now? Okay, um, so, and, and guys, that, that, that is the benefit of kind of writing this the way I did, okay? Uh, I'm just going to do a kind of a side note here. Don't write this down. If I would have written out, you know, negative radical 3 plus i seven times, Kind of see the pain in the butt that this creates. So that's what six. So one more time. If I foil those two, I'm gonna get two minus two radical three i, right? If I foil those two, am I gonna get the same result if I did, if I do it right? If I did it right the first time, hopefully. Um, so that's gonna be that one. And if I foil those two, is that gonna be that one? Okay. Uh, so, because we're foiling the same two binomials, um, I'm going to get that kind of repeat. So, maybe writing something like this might allow me to kind of shorten the amount of things that I have to write down. Uh, but now, now I have to do this uh, foiling here and do the foiling here. So, let's go 2 times 2 is 4. Uh, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4 root 3i. I'll have another negative 4 root 3i. And now I have 2 times 2, which is 4, uh, times 3 is 12 i squared, right? Turns into 12 i squared. What's that i squared going to turn into? Negative 1. So now I've got 4 minus 12, so that's going to give me negative 8 
minus 8 root 3 times i, right? Is that okay? So that's taking care of those two. Now I still need to deal with these two. Let's, let's foil those two out. Uh, when I foil those two out, 2 times negative root 3 is negative 2 root 3. Um, 2 times i is 2i. I'm going to have a positive, uh, what, 6i here. I'm going to multiply the, the insides, and then last times last will be a negative 2 uh, root 3 i squared. I squared turns into a negative. Okay, so that's nice in this case because those two things cancel out, right? And now leaves me that product is just 8i. And now I can distribute this, so I get 8 um, times negative 8, so it gives me negative 64i um, minus 64 root 3 i squared. So now my i squareds turn into a negative. So what I'm what I'm left with is 64 radical 3 minus 64 i. Okay. Now there's a lot of stuff that we did there. I just want to make sure real quick before we go through and do this with polar form that that is indeed the right answer. So let's just type in negative square root of 3 plus i. It gives me that. So that's the uh, z that I started with. Now I'm just going to take z sub 1. We're going to raise that to the seventh power. So see what that gives me. Uh, so you know, 64i, the negative 64i is right. So let's see what 64 times square root of 3 looks like. Hopefully it's that. Yep, okay. So we're good. We've done it right. Does that make sense? Would you guys agree? And if we if we if we were timed ourselves, that took. Uh, let's see here. That took seven minutes. Okay. Um, maybe not something that we really want to spend seven minutes doing. All right. So I'm gonna write my answer up here real quick, and we're gonna see if we can get to that a little bit quicker. All right, so using Des Moyes' theorem, Des Moyes' theorem says find this um, complex number in polar form. So I need to find R. So R is square root of A squared plus B squared. Okay, And remember, that's just a coefficient. So that's uh, the negative root 3. I'll square that. So that just gives me 3, right? And then the 1 squared just gives me 1, so my radius is 2. Okay? Theta, then, is tangent inverse of B over A. Okay, so it's going to be tangent inverse. B over A would be 1 over uh, negative root 3. And that gives me, I'm going to write it this way, negative root 3 over 3. Uh, because I now know, I think that is 30 degrees, negative 30 degrees. I think, just let me double check. Second tangent, uh, square root of negative root 3 over 3. Yes, it gives me negative 30 degrees. Okay. Uh, now, that is equal to negative 30 degrees. Okay. Think about where this, and it's always a good thing when we're changing the polar to have a little bit of a picture. Negative root 3 plus 1. Negative root 3 would be this direction. Plus 1 would be that polar point right there. Does that kind of make sense? It's going to be in the second quadrant. Does negative 30 degrees make sense for the second quadrant? No. Okay. So what we're telling, or what the calculator is telling us right now, is that that angle right there is 30 degrees. So what would theta that I'm really interested in be? 150. Okay. And I'm going to use, instead of 150, um, can we use 5 pi over 6? 
That's the radian mode, right? Radian version. So now, Jeremiah? Because when I plot this in rectangular form, this tells me to go basically in the negative x direction, so negative a, and then the positive one tells me to go up one. Um, so now in polar form, guys, this this point, you know, if we're calling this z, z in polar form is two cis five pi over six. Okay. The Moyes, uh, I believe it's re. Uh, De Moyes says if you have z equaling r cis theta, and you want to raise that to the nth power, you rewrite it as r to the nth cis n times theta. Well, now our taking this, our n is to the seventh power, right? So I'm going to go two to the seventh cis five pi over six times seven. 2 to the 7th gives me 128. Okay. Uh, 5 pi uh, over 6 times 30, or times 7 gives me 35 pi. 35 pi over 6. I'm just going to remove 12 pi over 6 from that, and 12 pi over 6 again from that. Okay. Um, and that should give me. 35 minus 24 give me 11 pi over 6, right? So it's the same thing as 11 pi over 6. Okay. And that then is z to the 7th. Now, is it in rectangular form? No. So let's just convert it to rectangular form to see if we do end up with that same number that we came up with uh, through that foiling process. So I go 128, cis means cosine of 11 pi over 6, plus 128i sine of 11 pi over 6. What is the cosine of 11 pi over 6? Radical 3 over 2. Okay. Plus then... 128i, what's the sine of 11 pi over 6? Negative 1 half. Now, if I evaluate that, does that provide me 128 and that 2 are in cancel out? Give me 64, radical 3, and then the 128 times negative 1 half is negative 64. Is that the same thing as that? Okay. Now, Obviously, if we look at the time it took on that one, so we were at seven and a half. It only took us about five and a half minutes. Okay, now obviously, the more proficient you get, okay, maybe some of the things you skip, you try to skip writing down the formula. Um, maybe, um, you know, the 35 pi over six theory, that, uh, I think that's 11 pi over six. Hopefully, we're, we're pretty proficient at that. I wrote theta equals change inverse g over a. I wrote all that stuff out uh, pretty elaborately. Um, I think there's some things if you're doing that on your own, you probably don't write down, and it probably is even quicker. Okay? Um, but that's what the Moyer theorem says: is that if I want to foil something complex, now we're going to foil it multiple times. Um, doing it in polar form is, is a quicker process. Okay? Um, so let's say that I have a for some reason, and I. Um, you know, I'm not sure what that reason would be. Maybe we're working uh, with electricity or something like that, and I need a computer program or uh, some device that can feed back information. And, and a lot of times in electricity, you deal with complex numbers, uh, with like resistance and ohms and stuff like that. Um, if I need to raise something to a power, I don't want my computer program to be foiling because it's going to take a lot of memory. It's going to take a lot of power. And, and eventually, it's uh, all in the time. And, and, and you know, if you think about it as, um, you know, the, the person that's, that's creating the software um, or using the software, the time is going to go through money. Or time is money, right? Okay. Uh, so the idea is, okay, well, let's program our uh, software to take a rectangular um, coordinate. So 
that that we generate or we develop through measurement somehow, uh, maybe measuring resistance in, in a circuit, and then we, we convert that, we, our program converts that to polar force real quick, it does the multiplication for us real quick, it converts it back to the tangent, of, and that gets put back to it. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and, and that process will actually save computers uh, time, RAM, memory, that type of stuff, and, and ultimately money. Uh, so those are things that uh, maybe uh, we see the benefit of some of this uh, math for. Yes, Josh. Yes. Um, let's see here. So guys, there, it's, I mean, you repeat that process over and over and over again. Um, regardless of what Z you start with, whatever Z I start with, uh, and whatever power I want to raise it to, uh, I change it to polar, I go Rn, cis, to n theta, and ultimately that gives me my um, z to the nth. And then if I need to change it to rectangular, I can change it to rectangular. Uh, I want to talk about how we do this with complex numbers. Or sorry, roots of complex numbers. In, the nth root of a complex number. Um, and this is, this is a component of the Moyes theorem. Um, says if z is equal to r cis theta okay and n is a positive integer okay then Z has N distinct nth roots. Okay. Um, so what we write here is, you know, so if I'm starting with z equals r cis theta, and uh, let's say that I'm looking for uh, z equals uh, the nth root. So let me write it this way because it, it, I think it makes a little bit more sense. Remember the nth root of something. Uh, let me make a note up here. If I take the nth root of, let's just say a. Can I rewrite that as a to the one n, one over n? Those are the same thing. Okay. So if I start with z equaling r cis theta raised to the one over n. Okay. Then what we'd write. Okay. Um, now I'm going to write, um, use this variable W sub K, don't really worry too much about it being a W, um, is equal to what I, what this says here, what the Moyes theorem kind of gets to is that you take the nth root of R, so I'll take R, and I'll raise it to the one nth root. Then I have cis, okay, and then I go theta plus 2 pi k all over n, okay? And what that is going to do for me is that's going to give me when k is equal to 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1, that is the tool that's going to provide me the nth distinct roots. Meaning, and, and we, we do this with square roots, if, if I take the square root of a number, how many solutions do I really get? Two. Okay? So there are two different numbers that when I multiply together, let's say I'm taking, talking about uh, like, I don't know, 25. There are two distinct numbers that I can multiply together to give me 25, right? 5 times 5 and negative 5 times negative 5, correct? Okay. Um, 
same principle is kind of applying here when I'm taking the nth root of a complex number. When I'm taking the fourth root, there should be four numbers that I can multiply by themselves to get four times to get um, the complex number. Okay? So I'm going to do a couple examples of this. Um, the only part that people struggle with is that K part for the most part is, is that they, uh, they forget that that's a component. And they, they find uh, the first nth root and then they don't go any further than that. Okay? Um, and just kind of messing around with some of the technology this morning. Uh, I don't think, at least I can't figure it out. Uh, when I go into GeoGebra and I ask to find the nth root, it just provides me the one when k is equal to zero. Okay, it won't show me the other ones, but I want I want to work with you uh, and, and ho hopefully seeing um, these additional roots. So let's start with um, one that is. Uh, not too bad. Let's go two. Let's say Z. This in blue. Z is equal to two plus two i. Two plus two i. Okay. And I want to find the cube roots. So let's say find the three cube roots of Z. Okay, uh, and, and a lot of times they call those, um, you know, our textbook uses the W, so W sub 0, W sub 1, W sub 2, meaning just find the first root, there would be the second cube root, and there would be the third cube root. Does that kind of make sense? Um, when I do, so this is going to look like, so I'm going to take Z, is equal to 2 plus 2i. And I'm going to be raising that to, the, if I'm taking the cube root, it would be raising to the one-third power, right? Okay. I'm going to rewrite that as um, in, in terms of a polar form. Okay. So I need to know what r is, and I need to know what theta is. Okay. r is going to be the square root of 4 plus 4, isn't it? So root 8, and I'm going to leave it as root 8. I'm not going to simplify that or um, rationalize it. Okay, I'm just going to leave it as radical 8. I think there's going to be some fraction stuff here, rational fraction stuff here that, that makes that a little bit nicer for it. Uh, so that's R. And then theta, tangent inverse of 2 over 2, right? This is your B over your A. And that is in the first quadrant, so it is... Exactly what our calculator spits back to if it's five or four. So z in polar form, z is equal to root eight cis of pi over four. Okay. So now, if I want to take this and rate and I want to find the cube roots of it, obviously z cube root would be, it would look something like this, raise that to the one third. So now I'm going to take my radical 8, so my radical 8, which is 8 to the one half, and I'm going to raise that to the one third, because that's taking the cube root of radical 8. Does that make sense? Taking the cube root of something provides me ultimately the sixth root, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all right, so now I will have cis okay, of theta. Well, theta was pi over 4 plus 2 pi k all over n, and n is... And in this case, 3. Is everybody okay with that so far? Uh -huh. 
Um, so now this is this is the uh, the Z that is going to be, or maybe we call it the W. This is this is W sub K. That's the thing that is going to help us build our uh, three different roots. Okay. Um, so now all we have to do is allow K to be zero, one, and two. Okay. So when K is equal to zero, I'm just going to come to this thing and plug in zero. Okay. Um, so it's going to be eight to the one sixth cis of pi over four. If k is zero, doesn't this thing go away? And then I'll divide by three. So we get tablet died, there we go. Over three. So that turns into uh, eight raised to the one sixth cis of pi over twelve. Um, when k is 1, I'm going to get 8 to the 1 6 cis. Now it's going to be pi over 4 plus 2 pi k. Okay, so I'm going to write that as 8 pi over 4. Does that make sense? All over 3. So that turns into 8 raised to the 1 6 cis. Okay, now it's going to be, what, 9 pi over 4 divided by 3, so 9 pi over 12. And now when k is 2, we have 8, 1, 6, cis, pi over 4, plus now 2 pi times 2, so 4 pi which is 16 pi over 4 divided by 3. And I think maybe you can start to see a pattern here when we start taking the nth roots of these. These two things differed by an 8 pi over 12, right? Let's see if this one, 17 pi over 12, is that difference 8 pi over 12? Yeah, so that, that's a nice thing because... You know, what if I was trying to find the sixth root or something like that? There'd be six of these things, right? Uh, and maybe I don't like adding that 2 pi k over 3 to each one of those. I can use that pattern in the argument uh, of when k is 0 and k is 1 to help me find out what that argument looks like when k is 2 and 3 and so forth. Okay? Now, I'm done because I have three solutions, right? And we're looking for the three roots. So what this means to us, guys, is you know, and we I'm going to evaluate these. Uh, it turns out that eight raised to the one six is actually radical two. Um, so if you want to write this as radical two, cis of pi or twelve, I, I don't care if you write that, because um, we're going to grab our calculator and see what this thing looks like. It's nine pi or twelve, um, and pi or twelve. Those are fifteen degree increments, so they're not going to have real nice. Uh, values off the unit circle. So we're going to grab our calculators and see what happens here with those. Let's say, uh, actually, let me use GeoGebra. All right, let's clean everything up here. Um, if I take square root of 2, um, times then cosine of pi over 12 plus i times sine of pi over 12. Okay. That should give me that number right there. Okay. So there's, there's the first root, 1.37.37i. Uh, okay. And probably a good idea to maybe, I think I got my rounding here at two decimal places. If we go, you know, four decimal places, we see maybe a little bit better of an answer. Uh, so now I'm going to do the same thing. 
I would kind of cheat with the way I type this in. Let's see. Control C. Control V. Uh, then it became 9 pi over 12, right? Oh. Control V. Z2. All right, so we get that one. That's kind of a nice answer, isn't it? Okay. Uh, and then we'll do one more. So Z sub 3. I want that to be 17 pi over 12. Okay. So those are my three roots, okay, that come from what we started with of Z equaling to so Z4, which was our first root that we started with, or our first uh, complex number we started with. So the red one, okay, is what Z1, Z2, and Z3 all stem from, okay? What does that mean to us, okay? It means if I take Z1 and I multiply it by itself three times, it should give me the exact same thing as Z sub 4, give me that red point. If I take Z sub 2 and multiply it by itself three times, it should give me that point Z sub 4. Does that make sense? So let me let me just see if GeoGebra does this. If I go Z, let's just say Z5 is equal to, let's say, Z sub 1 raised to a third power. So if I take that complex number and cube it, let's see if it puts a point right here on Z4. And it did, right? Okay. If I take uh, and let Z sub 6 equaling Z2 to the third power. Z sub 2 raised to the third power. You see that it put it right on top of that other point, Z4, Z5. Does that make sense? And then if I take this last one, Z3, uh, I should be able to cube it. And it should give me Z7, the exact same spot. Okay? Those are the three points in the polar plane that you can cube and end up with that original point 2 plus 2i. Okay? Um, so what happens, you know, if, if I ask GeoGebra just to, let's let's hide this, let's just say GeoGebra start off with Z4, Z sub 4, and I ask it to take the cube root of that, so raise it to the one third. You see it only gives me the one solution, right? It won't give me um, the multiple solutions, but maybe you can do your case um, expression line argument to kind of help you generate the other, the other piece on that one. Uh, they're only a front step. I don't know if there's a, there's a call sequence there that type in to get the other ones or not. Anybody kind of messing around with it or not. Um, does that kind of make sense? I want to take a look at Desmos real quick and see what that if that has the capabilities of I don't, I don't even know if Desmos has the ability to graph complex numbers. So if I go 2 plus 2i yeah, it has to create a slider for I, so it doesn't know that I is imaginary. Um, I use capital I. No. No. All right. Um, sometimes with complex numbers, you'll, uh, depending on the kind of the field that you're in, whether you're in the mathematics field or maybe an engineering field, um, you'll give you the I for the complex number uh, for square root of negative one, or you'll use J. Okay. Uh, in uh, electrical circuits and stuff like that, they use J because I represents current um, and electricity. So J is only, we don't want to be really confusing. Okay? Uh, but that's finding complex groups. Now, it's not the most enjoyable thing to do, I wouldn't think. Okay? Um, but if they ask us to do you know, let's, let's just do one that's, do one more example before, before we run out of time here. Let's take, uh, or write down our rule, Z raised to 1 nth becomes R to 1 nth, cis, uh, what is it, theta plus 2 pi k over N, okay? Um, let's say that our Z 
let's just say we're taking um, let's just do one. Z is one. And I'm going to find the eight roots. Of one. Okay. So if z is one, we gotta change that to, to polar. That's 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 one plus zero i right now. Okay. We gotta change that to polar. So in polar form, r is going to be one plus zero, which is just one. Theta is gonna be tangent inverse of B over A, 0 over 1, so it's 0, okay? And if I think about this, maybe I don't even need to grab my calculator. Maybe I don't even need to do tangent inverse. If I'm doing 1 plus 0 I, isn't it right there? Go out 1 on the A axis or the real axis, and then up 0 in the imaginary axis, so it's that right there. So what degree is that? Or what radian is that? It'd be 0, right? Okay. Um, so tangent inverse of 0 is 0, uh, so theta is 0. Um, so that's kind of nice. Right now we're looking then at z in polar form to be 1 cis of 0. If I'm going to take the eighth root of that, z to the 1 eighth is going to be 1 cis 0 raised to the 1 8 that looks like then 1 raised to the 8 cis now it'll be 0 plus 2 pi k all over 8 right and now we're going to have to find when k is equal to 0 k is equal to 1 k is equal to 2 and hopefully, once we have those, finding three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, it's just kind of looking at the common difference for um, the argument. So, when I find k is one, okay, sorry, k is zero, okay, I get zero plus zero over eight, which is just zero, right? Okay. So I get 1, 8th root of 1. Do you guys agree that the 8th root of 1 is just 1? Okay. So I get 1 cis 0. Okay. Now when k is 1, okay, I'm going to get, again, 1 raised to 1 8th. That number out front, that r to the 1 over n is always the same throughout all of these. Uh, but then I'll have cis. Now, if k is 1, this is 2 pi over 8, right? Well, 2 pi over 8 is 5 or 4, isn't it? K is 1. You're left with 2 pi over 8. 2 and the 8 reduced to, to 5 or 4. So now what is, what's it going to look like when K is 2? 1 cis of 4 pi over 8, which ends up being 1 half pi, right? So there's a common difference of pi over 4 between those two, right? So there's going to be a common difference of pi over 4 between those two. And there's going to be a common difference. Okay, so this one's going to be, what, 3 pi over 4? This is, one, is going to be pi. This one's going to be 5 pi over 4. Um... One cis, this one's going to be 3 pi over 2. One cis, 7 pi over 2. And this one here is going to be 2 pi. Okay. So what that tells me, guys, if we were to evaluate these, just think about them. All right, if I go in, in, in rectangular form, 1 cis of pi over 4, well, that is radical 2 over 2 plus i radical 2 or 2, meaning that if I take that thing right there and raise it to the 8th power, okay, if I take the square root of 2 
divided by 2 plus i times the square root of 2 divided by 2. I get that point right there. If I raise that to the 8th power, z sub 1 raised to the 8, it gives me 1. Does that make sense? Okay. So you should be able to do that with all eight of those. Okay. Um, and those eight things, they're all going to be, they all have the same radius, don't they? So all of those are going to be on the circle here. If I, if I draw a circle um, with a center here and a radius of square root of 2 over 2. Oh, not 2 over 2. What is it? It was, I'm sorry, 1. R to the 1 in was 1, right? So let's do this. All, all eight of my roots, all eight of my roots are going to look like that. They're going to be all in that circle. Does that make sense? And what happens is that they're symmetrically spaced on that circle. If we were to go back to the one with the cube root, they were on a circle of a radius of radical 8. Sorry, radical, radical 2, I mean, um, And they were, there are three of them, they were all awfully spaced 120 degrees from one another. Does that make sense? Okay. You get that symmetry with your solution. Yes. I saw an 8.1 homework. Um, well, 8.3.